Yay. Yeah. Woo. What's up? Look at that. That's 50 motherfucking episodes, bitch. Mm-hmm. 50 episodes. Welcome to the Dungeon Bros Podcast. I'm Connor. And I'm Sam. We are not brothers. Nor are we in Dungeon. We get we got to the we got to the got to the intro quick because this is a very special day. Yes. It's a very special day in the lore of the Dungeon Bros Podcast. Uh we've been doing this for a hundred weeks. We have been. This is episode fifty. Uh so almost two years. Two more episodes and it'll be two years since we started doing this, which is uh, fucking stupid. Ludicrous. Yeah. And guess what? It's only been good for like a couple weeks. <laughs> <laughs> we, are, we have been terrible this whole time. Well, it, it, not right now. I mean, like, it was good for a week, and then like for three months it was bad, and yeah, it was yeah. good for a week, and I think we strung together two good weeks once. We're, we're getting up there, you know? We're doing... Someday. We're doing something. People will say, oh, that was an okay. That was okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Ooh, one... I... I look forward to the day where where we put out a podcast and the and the response um, exists and that'd be cool and is huh all right yeah yeah you know we don't want you to go home with hands hurting from clapping or bellies hurting from laughing we just want you to go yeah all right yeah okay yeah, yeah. yeah sure sure yeah maybe maybe occasionally you're listening to something we have to say and you go a little, a little sharp exhale through the nose yeah okay. yeah a little. That's all. Oh, yeah. Maybe a smirk to accompany it. That's the ideal situation. But this, our Lord's 50th episode of the Dungeon Rose podcast, sponsored by Spike TV. We want to shout out the Hot Take Olympics coming to Spike TV this fall. Uh, the, the episode they're promoting right now is... <laughs> what? The episode we're promoting now is... Team Asterian from Baldur's Gate 3 can't actually have sex with your character because as a vampire, he doesn't really have blood and thus is unable to get hard. Versus. Uh, versus, in a D&D t- campaign, you can totally kill a child and have the only repercussion being now you have two D&D campaigns. On Spike TV, Thursdays at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thank you for sponsoring the Dungeon Bros Podcast. I, I've, been, I've been following... Asterian can't have sex because he's a vampire, doesn't have blood. Mm. Um, team for a while now. They've got a lot. Of, they got a lot of good rookies. They had a really good draft class this year. They're really, they're really making some strides in the league. So I'm, I'm I, I really want to see how they do in in this opening weekend. You know. Yeah, team, uh, team Kill a Child in the D and D campaign is a, isn't a rebuilding year. So we don't, we're not looking, year. we're not yeah. looking too highly on them. But hey, you never know. They can, La- the last colors. year, last year was the child killing year. <laughs> this year is the forming the new D and D campaign year. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be watching closely. Hopefully, you will be too. But speaking of Baldur's Gate three, Samuel, you've been playing Baldur's Gate three. Yeah, I picked it up uh, uh, a couple weeks ago because it's on sale. No, no, it was it was you paid full price for that bitch. Yes, it had just come out on PS five. It was a month after its release on PC, uh, so I'm behind the ball on most people. I mean, there's a lot of people that like to be behind the balls of Baldur's Gate three. Indeed, there are a lot of balls in Baldur's. Yeah. You you can balls select game. which balls, balls you game. want. Ooh, you can you can select your balls. Yeah. You can select which balls are presented to you. You can go to the gate of balls. It's yeah. I think that's the plot of it. Is is just collecting ball gate of, three. Yeah. It's just collecting scrotums. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Already off the rails. <laughs> I know the game quite well, as you can tell. Yes. Yeah, there's like there's like uh, mind flayer tadpoles and shit. Yeah, that's yeah. that's the that's the one of the base plots. It's only re- that's the only reason your group is together, right? Kind of, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's honestly a better uh, or um, as as equally strong of a through line as to why the group is together as um, any D and D campaign yeah, ever plays. Yeah. Why are you guys together? Um, you know, we kind of found each other, and we killed a dude. Sh- shared traumas, indeed. Indeed, indeed but yeah it is it is one of those games that and this hasn't happened to me for a very long time where i'm playing the game and i'm not processing how much time i'm spending in game so our, our buddies our friend salem and i uh we're playing we're playing a multiplayer vert campaign and uh last saturday we ended up just staring at the tv for i think about eight hours mm. uh, on co-op that's classy and that i haven't done in several years for most games yeah i remember Gosh, so when 
So when Kingdom Hearts 3 came out, obviously I played it for like 12 hours at midnight. I, I basically let the sun rise. Actually, probably longer than that. I probably let the sun rise and then set and then I went to bed hmm. uh, after playing it because I'm an obsessive person. But like, like co-op style, like you're with the you're with the, the homies mm -hmm. and you're playing the games probably hasn't happened to me since like the original Destiny days in college. Wow. Yeah, when um, my roommate and I, we would sit, like I would be, I would be sitting in one of like the cheap wooden, de basically the chair I'm sitting in now, and he would be sitting like ninety degrees perpendicular to me, and then we'd each have our TV set up, and yeah. we'd both be playing, we'd be like doing Destiny raids, and then like we have other college friends that were in their dorm rooms, basically doing the exact same thing, and then we'd be doing raids and shit together. It was a good time. Anyway. Anyway, also back in high school, uh, Killzone 3. Mm. Salem and I played a lot, a lot, a lot of Gears of War 3, mm. the Horde mode. Um, mm. And yeah, that was, that was another one of those games where, yeah, we'd sit down <clears throat> and start playing through. And then eight hours later, we look up and go, hmm, well, that's potentially problematic. <clears throat> pardon me. You're pardoned. Thank you. From life. <laughs> and then okay. I stab him. Uh, we all, I also said we were going to do a bit about about putting socks on before the podcast because the internet's weird, but I feel like that kind of we came and went. For another time. Well, I'm yeah. sure we'll forget we'll, socks again we'll, at some point. The, inter the internet loves a barefoot. They also love naked human feet. Indeed. As well. Indeed. Um, so we like to keep uncovered, covered. Uncovered uh, bare feet as well, you yeah, know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or fur covered or shaven. Yeah. Bare feet and human feet. And hobbit feet. Hobbit feet. That you can't sexualize a hobbit foot because that's basically a shoe. <laughs> people sexualize shoes. <clears throat> Pardon me. That's a good point. God, people are into weird shit. Anyway, this the Dungeon Runs podcast is ostensibly a D and D a D and D Magic the Gathering podcast. Uh, you can find it on Apple, Google, Spotify, YouTube Music, etc. Wherever, wherever, wherever podcasts are served for the most part. Mm-hmm. We also have a TikTok, we have an Instagram, a YouTube, X, Discord, Amazon Storm, Merch Storm, Monday Night Match, yeah, like, all the shit, all the shit. All we'll the say shit. it again before the end, don't worry. Well, wait, I'm, I'm sure we will. I'm sure we will. Upcoming releases. Uh, this just came out, and we're going to talk about it later, but Fandelver and Below the Shattered Obelisk is out now as a, since the last episode of the podcast and is being reviewed quite well. We'll be talking about that. In the very near future. Uh, Planescape Adventures in the Multiverse is starting to get previews right now. A lot of media outlets have been getting like different little tidbits of information. So you have to like annoyingly go to a bunch of places. Uh, that is coming out on October 16th. And then The Book of Many Things coming out November 14th. Those are the only D&D books that we know of in existence right now prior to the release of the updated 5th edition from 1D&D. &D. Yes, that should be coming early next year. Yes, yes. I... Still annoyed that they're calling it 5th edition. I mean, they keep, you know, it's honestly with the amount of revert, of changes that they've made, well, that they've proposed in these playtests and then rolled back, especially here in the last playtest, a lot of uh, changes were were rolled back. Um, it's it's kind of starting to look like it's... It is. is it's always, fifth edition with a little salt. You know, yeah. the little, the little. Yeah, a little salt based salt. Whereas, whereas when we started these play tests, it was like, no, this is definitely something new. Five point five. They've already done the point five before. Yeah. Just saying. Just saying. Upcoming Magic: The Gathering releases. We've got the second round of the Lord of the Rings cards on November third. I'm skipping ahead because I love the Lord of the Rings. I put it at the top of the list all the time. Uh, and we've got some. We've got we've seen the cards, a lot of the cards from the the new set, and who doggy, they're hot. <laughs> yeah, they've really reached into the bag of of mechanics and pulled out Everything. just a handful, just to a whole slap lot. on, exert, ascend, split second, formidable, uh, renown, <laughs> renown, uh, annihilator, delve. Yeah, we'll we'll get we'll get deep into all of that as as the second headline here, but. You get the Doctor Who Commander decks coming out on October 13th. The Lost Caverns of Ixalan, which we also got some card previews for at the last Magic Con of the year. Uh, that'll be November 17th, 2023. But let's get, let's, we've waffled on. We have waffled. We. Much like a house, we have waffled. I'm more of a French toast guy than a waffle guy. So let's move on. 
Fandelver Below, the Shattered Obelisk, is reviewing very, very, very well. Um, <laughs> for those of you that don't know, it's a 64-page adventure book, uh, the original Lost Minds of Fandelver, which was included in the starter set almost a decade now. <clears throat> My apologies, we just can't. We need to. We got. We're very allergy phlegm. season. We're very phlegmy today. We are full phlegm. Yummy. The Lost Minds of Fandelver was a 2014 release with the starter set that was 64 pages, designed to take players from levels one to five, and could be played by pretty much anyone. It is widely regarded as a very good starter set adventure book and very well balanced. Very highly recommended. They went back and they've revamped it, revitalized it with. Fandalver and Below the Shattered Obelisk, adding several new chapters to the end of it, as well as tweaking some of the story beats and kind of changing the tone very heavily in the second half of the adventure. We're not going to get into any spoilers here. Uh, you can get it for $54 right now on Amazon. First, The first half of the book, not exactly the same. There's a ton of new art, new maps, and they've tried to make the, the story of the original campaign a lot more complete. Uh, and then once you get into chapter five, the entire tone takes a very heavy turn. Uh, it doesn't really happen all at once, but that's when they start to get sort of mind flare vibe, very eldritch horror vibe. Um, we're not going to get into story, story spoilers here. Uh, I, I've read a little bit about what is up with the obelisks, mm -hmm. but the obelisks have been notable landmarks that have been referenced in a lot of D&D adventure books. Uh, since the release of fifth edition and they've always been just like oh there's some mysterious shit here and there might be like some weird interaction that you can do that doesn't really mean anything and then they're just not talked about anymore in those books and this kind of pulls a lot of that together um the main complaint that people are having is that the, the final boss of the adventure is kind of mid but it's the final boss of a DD &D campaign that's <laughs> kind of how they go very often um i'm kind of surprised I was, I was kind of expecting this to just kind of be a, a, a farted out thing and not be all that good because it's in in the shadow of, of the revision to 5th edition. Yeah, and we've seen a lot of poor reception for the past couple of, uh, for the past year of, of releases for sure. Uh, so yeah, that's a, this is a much beloved uh, storyline. They mentioned in one of the articles, um, and I've listened to it, the uh, Adventure Zone does their first their very first hey we're new to D&D too let's play some D&D &D, uh in that in the in the lost starting with the lost minds of Fandelver um so it's good to hear that they've actually somebody who really loves this piece definitely got to be in charge of it oh for sure for sure um okay if you don't want spoilers for Fandelver and Below the Shattered Obelisk's final boss skip ahead a little bit I would say I put a timestamp in there, but I'm not going to remember to do that. So this is your warning for spoilers for Fandelver and Below the Shattered Obelisk's final boss. The whole po the whole campaign leads up to like fighting uh, a representation of a god, mm -hmm. basically uh, a godlet that's got that's very very uh, illithid inspired. It's called Refraction of Ilvash. Uh, it is a huge aberration mind flare. This challenge rating 15, the main reason people are upset, armor class 11. Super easy to hit. 199 hit points. Not that many hit points. Only has bonuses to intelligence and wisdom saving throws. They're good bonuses, but yeah, you have a lot of other abilities that affect only, other things. Only resists non-magical bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing, immune to poison and psychic. Obviously immune to just a wide array of uh, conditions. conditions. Yeah. And like this isn't this isn't like a weak attack by any means, but it's it's multi attack. It makes two dissonant claw attacks plus eleven to hit, uh, with an average damage of twenty five. Yeah, which I mean, this is still a fairly a fairly it's a decent amount of damage, but it's not gonna like strike fear into the hearts of players at the level that you're gonna be taking on this this boss at the main benefit is that if it hits a, if it hits a creature that's concentrating on a spell the concentration breaks mm -hmm. which i think is an interesting mechanic uh and then it's mind blast is just a dc 19 intelligence saving throw or taking an average of 33 damage uh, psychic damage 
and be stunned for one minute that they can repeat the save at the end of their turns. Recharges on five or six, so you know. And then it's spell casting doesn't really do anything. Yeah, they're not super great spells. Great. Detect magic, detect thoughts, dispel magic, modify memory, and then once per day you get in, uh, feeble mind and plane shift for itself only, and then it can teleport. Uh, legendary actions, you, you use two of them to make two claw attacks, um, or you you give someone disadvantage on ability checks, attack rolls, and saving throws until the end of their next turn for one legendary action. So it also it does also have five legendary resistances as opposed to the normal three, mm-hmm. uh, but you would kind of expect that for a boss monster. The main the main gripe is is damage damage in versus damage out for this boss um it, it's it's a big i don't i don't one big enemy against any D D party mm-hmm. is going to be really tough to balance yes you're going to need multiple bodies it's a lot easier to balance multiple bodies and then if you're going to have a big boss it's going to need to be more powerful than you think it should be or uh, yeah, we've that's something uh, often talked about in, you know, Reddit forums and YouTube videos is how to make boss monsters better and how to make the the whole encounter better. And it's it's very rarely just make the boss more powerful. It's yeah, give him minions and give the boss uh, environmental hazards that they have you know protection with, and things like that. Um, so I, I haven't we haven't read the entire setup of the battle, but it's sounding it's sounding very much like your barbarian can just hit walk up and whack this a couple of times and it'd be down. That that's the thing is you can the party is level twelve mm-hmm. by the time you get to this boss. Level twelve characters need to deal two hundred damage that only resists non magical damage, poison and psychic. Immune to poison and psychic. Mm-hmm. Like and it, it, you only need an eleven to hit, and you're likely to already have your in your magical weapons right now. Yeah. Probably for sev- you know, probably for at least seven levels. Uh, you're likely, you know, your spellcasters are going to have big spells at this point. And it doesn't even have like a regular fly. It has a it has a fly hover speed. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have a regular fly speed to be even be able to avoid melee combatants like a barbarian and forcing them to do other things. Um, they do, they do, th- this article that we're reading from Bell of Lost Souls does bring up that um, it is like a, you think the adventure is over and there's one last thing to fight. So it is at the end of a dungeon. Resources are going to be depleted a little bit. But at the same time, it's not, it's not really that intimidating at all. Like I would, I would be, will- I wouldn't be scared to go up against this stat block against like, like we could probably, I could, pro- we could probably get a party of five level sevens. Mm-hmm. That That's what I was thinking as out. well. Like that seven to eight, or like that six to eight range mm-hmm. in levels could absolutely take that out, depending on party composition. Um, anyway, we'll end spoilers there. Uh, that's not very helpful for people that were trying to skip forward, but <laughs> you know. Um, no more spoilers for Fandelver and Below the Shattered Obelisk. It's reviewing very, very well. If you are not into the whole weak final boss thing then sorry apparently the rest of it's really really good well paced well thought out creative and new yeah which as far as D adventure books go uh i'm happy to hear that not necessarily common anymore no not at all not at all uh, unless you have any other thoughts samuel no let's head on to magic uh, the last Magicon of the year gave us some card previews for Lord of the Rings, Lost Caverns of Ixalan, as well as Ravnica Remastered. We are, of course, we are, of course, going to be starting with the Lord of the Rings. Uh, we are getting some... These are... Okay. There's some more cards for Lord of the Rings. They're not going to be a complete set. They're not going to be in decks. Uh, but we are going to be getting some reprints... Uh, with Lord of the Rings art, such as Pact of Negation, uh, effective reprints of, for example, uh, Ishkana, Graf Widow, which is going to be Shelob, whose lair is death, is going to be reprinted. Um, Abyssal Persecutor, which I think is hilarious. Seasons Past, Sylvan Tutor, that kind of stuff with art 
that's in the style of the animated Lord of the Rings film from uh, the 70s. Yeah. Those ones are interesting because, not, I mean, some of those are, are worth a little bit. Um, Obviously, Sylvan Tudor is very, is more valuable, I think, than the other ones. Exactly. But the other ones, Pact of Negation, but they're all not, there's not necessarily high uh, high demand cards. Pact of, Neg- Pact of Negation, I would say, is the higher demand uh, in Sylv- Sylvan Tudor, Pact of Negation, and then probably Abyssal Persecutor. Yeah. As, then Seasons Past. Um, obviously, Seasons Past is like a great uh, game ender. Yeah. If you've got a lot of, um, if you've got a lot of cards in your graveyard. But at the same time, it's not letting you free cast them or anything. Um, it is, but it's more, it's kind of surprising that they didn't decide to take any like higher ball cards. You know, like uh, it was, we'll talk oh, about yeah. in a, high, a second. We're just going to see some high value cards in Ixalan being reprinted. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We'll get to that in a little bit. But, but I love the new art style. Uh, they're, they're also, we're going to be getting some new art for our, most of the rares and mythics from the original run of the Lord of the Rings set. Uh, that's got like the scroll art that makes them look like they're like, stories being depicted on parchment Mm -hmm. kind of a thing uh we had a leak of uh denethor steward of gondor uh that was in this art that was leaked uh and now we see the art for the same style of art for the one ring uh aragorn the uniter arwen uh mortal queen and i i'm saying art it's more accurate to say frame card frame yeah than art uh build a pony rosy cotton all that kind of stuff um that's not really the 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 big selling point. No. So there's going to be we we've talked previously about how there were Amazon listings for this holiday edition of Lord of the Rings and it's uh these packs that come with six cards that create a new uh art frame and you can put them in a frame that comes with the pack and then three set boosters as well mm-hmm. which i assume will be the holiday edition ones that have all the new stuff in it that, that would make sense. sense the the cards that they designed for these frames i had assumed these were going to be reprints yeah because for example they depict aragorn and legolas and gimli fight all of these depict parts of osgiliath and pelinor fields from return of the king mm-hmm. uh the climax war of the lord of the rings and i had assumed that they were going to be reprinting cards so i assumed that this first this first one that we've seen uh it has aragorn and he's holding Andoril, flame of the west and then there's legolas and gimli and then there's some orcs and then some uh rohan warriors I assumed we were going to be getting like Andoril Flame of the West reprinted with a new art and Aragorn the Uniter reprinted and Legolas Gimli Counter of Kills and like Orcish Bowmasters and that kind of stuff. These are all new design cards for yes. the art frames. And the designs are outlandish. Outlandish behavior coming from Wizards of the Coast here. So we're gonna we're gonna I'm I'm we're I'm gonna breeze through a lot of them, but uh, Andoril Re- Narsil Reforged is a two mana legendary artifact with Ascend, legendary artifact equipment equipped five or sorry equipped three with Ascend, which is if you control ten or more permanents, you get the city's blessing for the rest of the game. Whenever an equipped creature attacks, put a plus one plus one counter on each creature you control. If you have the city's blessing, you put two on them instead. Uh, you then have Aragorn Hornburg Hero, which is one red green white. A 4-4 where attacking creatures you control have first strike and renown one. When a creature with renown one deals combat damage to a player, if it isn't renowned, put a plus one plus one counter on it and it becomes renowned. Also, whenever a renowned creature you control deals combat damage to a player, double the number of plus one plus one counters on it. Um, plus one plus one counter synergies yeah. galore. We've, we now have seen renown and ascend. Next, we got split second which is on an instant card, Legolas's Quick Reflexes. As long as this spell is the on the stack, players can't cast spells or activate abilities that aren't mana abilities. Basically guaranteeing that this spell and is going to resolve and then affect everything beneath it. Yeah. Uh, it is a one mana green instant where you untap target creature and until end of turn it gains hexproof reach and whenever this creature becomes tapped it deals combat damage equal to its power up to one target creature. A fucking great instant spell in green. Um... We've got Gimli's Reckless Might. It's got it's an enchantment that gives creatures haste. Uh, whenever you attack creatures, you control with total power eight or greater, greater target attacking creature fights another one. Nothing too crazy there. But Isengard Unleashed is a sorcery for two red, red, red. 
Damage can't be prevented this turn. If a source you control would deal damage this turn to an opponent or a permanent an opponent controls, it deals triple damage instead. A damage tripler, where damage can't be prevented in any way. And it has flashback for red, red, red. And then uh, Ro Rohirrim Chargers, uh, it's a creature that's a 4-4 that you can exert to uh, basically uh, equipment cascade off the top. Into your, is it into your hand? Or, no, it's onto the. No, it's it's attached to a creature that is attacking or whatever. Uh, no, 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 no. Whenever you exert a creature, so if you build around the exert mechanic for a deck, Putting, like, just all that celebrant and other things like that in there. Yeah, so other exerting things. Uh, so many keywords. Oh yeah. So many uncommon keywords. We're not going to run through every single individual card because that's ridiculous. We are going to shout out mainly the keywords here. Um, Call Forth the Tempest has Cascade Cascade. Nazgul Battle Mace has Annihilator 1. Witch King the Sky Scourge has Undying. Uh, Mordor on the March. Uh, you're copying exiled creature cards from your graveyard, getting them on the battlefield with haste until the end of until your end of turn. And it has Storm. Storm. Which is very powerful. Uh, Fell Beast of Mordor has Devour One. <laughs> you have a new legendary land. Aloran's Searing Smite is that I love the I love that. They're going deep cuts for some of these references, by the way. Uh, Delve on the Sorcerer's Squall. Uh, we've got oh gosh, oh gosh, Splice onto Instant or Sorcery. Yeah, that's a specific one that has not been it, it populate. <laughs> We got Populate, we got Conspire, Replicate, Squad, Kicker. Basically everything's Kicker, but... <laughs> Everything um, is Kicker. Is Kicker Kicker? Kicker is Kicker. Is Multi-Kicker Kicker? Yes. Okay. Um, Every single one of these frames has one legendary creature, and all the cards in the frame work within the archetype of the creature. I think that's cool design. Oh, so yeah. You could build around these cards. Absolutely. All of them are brand new, unique designs. All of them are very special. I'm not going to go out and say all of them are exceptionally powerful, given some of their mana costs. If you can get around some of those mana costs, though. Like, Call Forth of the Tempest is the highest mana cost spell. It's a sorcery 5, red, red, red. 8 total, Cascade, Cascade, Call Forth of the Tempest deals damage e to each creature your opponents control equal to the total mana value of other spells you've cast this turn. So you get two free ones with that. And then as it's resolving, if you have excess mana, you can cast some other things and then add up the mana cost of all of them, even mm -hmm. though you're not actually spending that cost. Um, very powerful shit. Very powerful shit. What are what are some of the standout cards for you? Uh, the the Nazgul's uh, Mace. What is it? The Nazgul's Battle Mace. Battle Mace with Annihilator 1. Like it's a it's a five drop equipment. Um, Whenever a creature with Annihilator 1 attacks, defending player sacrifices a permanent. But it also gives the creature Menace, Death Touch, and something else, I believe. I can't... Yes. I pulled it off my screen. And Whenever an opponent sacrifices a non-token permanent, put that card onto the battlefield under your control, unless that player pays three life. Yeah, that's... like. Which, if, by the way, with Annihilator 1, they're forcing sacrifice. Oh, yeah. And that's not non-land permanents. That's just permanent. Mm -hmm. So if they got nothing else, you can start stealing their land. Yeah, or you just burn them more. That the deck style that the the Rakdos Nazgul thing has going on here is one hundred percent force sacrifice, burn, let the like force them to lose as much life as possible. So paying three life is a is a detriment that they're not willing to take, and mm -hmm. then you get free shit. Oh yeah, each of uh, like you're saying, a lot of these cards are very high costed, but in you know the basically each each one of these contains a game ender. Oh yeah, uh, a win condition, if if you will. Sorceress Squall, six blue, blue, blue. Delve, where each card you exile from your graveyard reduces the generic mana cost. Target opponent mills nine cards. Then you may cast an instant or sorcery spell from that player's graveyard without paying its mana cost. If that spell would be put into a graveyard, exile it instead. Delve, get rid of shit in your graveyard. Mm -hmm. So it's basically a three mana spell that lets you that forces you to that lets you mill an opponent and then cast one of their things for free. Gandalf of the Secret Fire, your classic Jeskai spell slinger, instant sorcery shit, um, gives everything, gives your instants and sorceries in your graveyard uh, suspend. 
basically. Yeah. Yeah. So you get a free cast later. <laughs> all very, all very, very good. Uh, I'm not going to gush anymore about these Lord of the Rings cards. They are obviously going to be pretty expensive cards, which makes the $30 price tag that they were attaching to these like new new art framed little gift pack things that they're doing seem much more reasonable. Oh, yeah. Then one. Yeah. If you're going to look for those in uh, singles, oh, yeah. you're going to probably be paying a couple bucks at least. Uh, a couple bucks for sure. A couple one, bucks one for or sure. Two. One or two. At least. A Maybe eight. Some money. S- definitely some money. Possibly. Some money. Some monies. Ooh. Yeah. Might have to pay it in both dollar, American dollars and euro. Dollar. Doll hairs. Interesting. Interesting. All right. We have the Lost Caverns of Ixalan. We got some cool dinosaurs that we can talk about. And also... Dinosaurs. Dinosaurus. And we're going to talk about Jurassic Park. Do, 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 Love it. Do. Uh, Galta Stampede Tyrant 5. Green, green, green. A 12-12 with Trample. 8 mana 12-12 with Trample. Whenever he enters the, enters the battlefield, put any number of creature cards from your hand onto the battlefield. Um, This is a legendary dinosaur, by the yeah. way. This, it also has like seven different arts or something stupid like that. I think, I think we've seen at least four. They've been go. they're definitely going hard on the multiple art versions in the set. Yeah. Um, again, an eight mana 12, 12 with trample that lets you put any number of creature cards from your hand onto the battlefield. No stipulation, not until end of turn. You just get it. Basically get to eight mana, cast all of the things you have in your hand. Yeah. But I, uh, that's not even the craziest thing I think in uh, that we've seen from the previews. What do, what is what's your what's your crazy one? The uh, uh, from the Jurassic Park uh, cards, the Indominus Rex Alpha. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. One that do? one hybrid Demir, hybrid Demir, green green, legendary mutant dinosaur six six. As Indominus Rex Alpha enters the battlefield, discard any number of creature cards. It enters the battlefield with a flying counter on it if a card this way, discarded this way has flying. Same is true for First Strike, Double Strike, Death Touch, Hexproof, Haste, Indestructible, Lifelink, Menace, Reach, Trample, and Vigilance. When Indominus Rex enters the battlefield, draw a card for each counter on it. That's that's rude. That's rude behavior. There, that, it's gonna, you get a lot of card draw, you get a lot of chance, you're in blue and black, so you have a lot of recursion, you have a lot of ways to flicker or bounce it. Yeah. You uh, you're gonna sculpt your hand, get a bunch of stuff, and then probably murder somebody with a hasted flying double strike uh, life link dinosaur. Oh yeah, uh, you're also going to be getting a lot of very valuable reprints out of this set. For example, the amazing tribal land cavern of souls. Choose a creature type. You can tap it to add a colorless mana, or you can tap it to add one mana of any color. Spend this mana only to cast a creature spell of the chosen type, and that spell cannot be countered. Perfect for either of those cards Mm -hmm. that we just discussed. Uh, There's also, like, seven different arts for it. Sure, like, most of them are the same art with different colors. So you have the green land, the black, the purple land, the yellow land, the green, the The just a whole bunch of different color options. Basically to match the theme of whatever deck, which I really like. Um, we also have Coercive Portal, a four mana artifact with Will of the Council at the beginning of your upkeep, starting with you. Each player votes for Carnage or Homage. If Carnage gets more votes, sacrifice Coercive Portal and destroy all non-land permanents. If Homage gets more votes or the vote is tied, draw a card. Extra draw every step, every step or... Just all the non-land permanents are gone. Yeah. You got, so, you got a board wipe waiting to happen. So. A time bomb of a board wipe for whenever the table decides it's time. Or you just get an extra draw every turn. Yeah. For four mana. You already talked about... We already talked about Galta, Stampede, Tyrant. So it goes through more of the arts. Uh, Huatali. Watley. Poet, Watley. Watley. Uh, it's been Huatali. desparked. Watley. Poet of Unity. A three mana two three where you can search your library for a basic and reveal it, put it into your hand. You can also pay three Boros Boros to exile it, and you get a four chapter saga, Roar of the Fifth People. First chapter, you get two three three dinosaurs. Second chapter, um, creatures you control have tap, add red, green, or white, which are the colors of the card. 
uh, third chapter, search your library for a dinosaur card, reveal it, put it into your hand, then shuffle, and then chapter four, dinosaurs you control, game double strike and trample until end of turn. I don't know if you know this about dinosaurs, Sam. They tend to be pretty big. They tend to be chunky. They do. They do. Uh, we also have Ogier, an Axonil, Deepest Might, legendary creature god, where when it dies, it transforms into a land where you can tap to add a red mana, pay two and a red to tap it to transform it again, basically letting it you, dies, becomes a land, and then you can choose to bring the god back yeah. if you want. Uh Activate only if red sources you control de- have dealt four or more non-combat damage this turn and only at sorcery speed. But... That's pretty easy to do in red. This card is going very well with Perforos and Solfam and all of the other amazing legendary red creatures that just want to deal a ton of damage. It's a 4-4 with Trample for four mana and then all of that. It also has, if a red source you control would deal an amount of non-combat damage less than his power to an opponent, that source deals damage equal to his power. It's a 4-4. Yeah. But so all of your... If this is your commander, all of your one mana shock spells for one damage deal four. Sam, end the festivities. Deals one damage to each opponent and every creature they control. Yeah. Uh, that's four to every... That's a, that's a one mana board wipe. And, and damage to the face. And damage to the face. Also... You can order, I believe you can order triggers and, and abilities like this, correct? As long as you can, yes. When your triggers go on the stack, you can put them down how you, how you can uh, order them how you want. Yeah. Um, so four, and then you can double them with other red legendary creep. I don't know why they're going so hard into this archetype, but I'm into it. Uh, yeah, it's all score. Yeah. Some of these cards. Oh, the full art lands for this set. They look like... They look like um, Jurassic Park meets like Avatar: The Last Airbender. That's a good meets, way of putting it. Yeah, meets like a little bit of like Studio Ghibli concept art. You know, what I'm travel talking? posters over travel two. poster. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, very beautiful full art lands. They also say basic land on the <laughs> like they have the way the way the text is framed on it. I find absolutely hilarious. Um, Oh my gosh, Lord of Atlantis. I forgot about Lord of Atlantis. Mana Crypt is being reprinted with like seven different color variants as well. A very popular staple in Commander. Uh, Sam, do you want to talk about the Jurassic Park cards? Yeah, Ian. uh, So we obviously talked about the Indominus Rex, obviously. But we also saw uh, two others. Well, I'll I'll do the other one first. Um, Which is Welcome to... It's mm-hmm. a saga that says uh, has three chapters. First one, for each opponent, up to one target non-artifact creature. Non-creature artifact they control becomes a 0-4 wall artifact creature with defender for as long as you control this saga. So that could be their soul ring. That could be their arcane signet. That could be their uh, portal to Phyrexia. Yeah. Uh, cre- I hope it's their portal to Phyrexia. <laughs> uh, then create, tap to two, create a 3-3 green dinosaur creature token with trample. It gains haste until the end of turn. And then three, destroy all walls. You know, like that soul ring you turned into a wall. Yeah, or the portal Phyrexia, or uh, hopefully you're playing against a wall deck. Uh, then exile, sorry, Arcades. Um, exile this saga, then return it to the battlefield, transformed under your control, and it becomes Jurassic Park. So welcome to Jurassic Park. It's a legendary, uh, legendary land, which each dinosaur card in your graveyard has escape, where the escape cost is equal to its mana cost plus exile three other cards in your graveyard and it has a uh, tap add green for each dinosaur you control that's a, um <clears throat> a land that taps for multiple manas sure it might take a little while to get there but <laughs> could end a game that's that's a big game ender and then the other the other Jurassic park card ian malcolm chaotic chaotic shin i can't pronounce say that Chaot- chaotic chaotic ian like a tactician, but chaotic. Yes. Uh, this is Jeff Goldblum's character, of course. Very Jeff Goldblum in the art. Uh, he's a legendary human scientist, 2-2. Whenever a player draws their second card on a turn, that player exiles the top card of their library. During each player's turn, that player may cast a spell from among the cards they don't own, exiled with Ian Malcolm. In cat, Use mana of any type to spend. They're spending mana to cast it. Anybody can cast anyone else's cards. Yup. That's chaotician indeed. I love that. That is, I, I kind of want to, I love the idea of a chaos deck 
And this is one of those decks that I don't even think I'd necessarily want to, you know, build a win, <laughs> build to win. Oh, I yeah. just want to build to, you know, mess everybody else up <laughs> or just to make chaos. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and then lastly, Ravnica Remastered. They're remastering the original Ravnica set. And uh, a lot of valuable reprints going to be popping up in here. Uh, I believe these are these called the Pain Lands. Or the shock lands. I can never remember. It's one of the shock. Two. These are shock lands shock because lands. they pay you pay the the dual lands that you pay two life to have them enter untapped. You get all of them, which is awesome because they are they need it. They are very they, they are very uh, high costed. The pain lands do too. You got a beautiful new art for the birds of paradise. Aurelia, exemplar of justice. Um, Fibblethip, the lost. Krenko, mob boss. Massacre girl. Niv Mizzet, Parun, and Tomic, Distinguished Advocist. Some of them are going to have some lovely anime art, which they've been doing a lot of lately, but those are just some of the valuable reprints that are going to be coming from the Ravnica set. Um, Tim, you got any, got any final thoughts? Oh, by the way, Ravnica Remastered launches just after the new year on January 12th. I'm going to add that so that I don't forget it. I'm glad to see we're getting a lot of these reprints, uh, a, lot the, a lot of the land ones especially, that have have been have been people have been asking for reprints because again they're expensive, and it sucks that not everybody can have them. Yeah, um, that's absolutely true. It is very frustrating. Are these going to drop them to the point that uh, everybody's going to be running them? No, no. but more people will. I suspect it will be much like the Jeweled Lotus was from uh, They'll take a hit. Commander Masters, where it'll drop probably, and some of them will become very affordable for... A, relatively a, affordable. A relatively affordable for, you know, several days. And then by the time you're like, you know, I probably should buy one. Nope, it's back up to full price. Yeah. Yeah. We got one more piece of meat, but this one will be a little bit quick. Uh... Dean to Beyond has done the Monstrous Compendiums yes. recently for the Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, this time they've crossed over with Magic the Gathering. Yet again, it's crazy. It's like they're owned by the same company. Wow. But Volume 4 of the Monstrous Compendium is going to feature Eldraine, the recently released Wilds of Eldraine set. Uh, a good set. You're a big fan of the set. Okay. But the Monstrous Compendium Volume 4 is going to feature... Uh, creatures from Eldraine is going to be a- available for purchase for five ninety nine on Dean Beyond's website. This is the second Monsters Compendium that has been released this year, following the release of Minecraft Monsters. Uh, the Ginger Brute is going to be featured there. The Cruel Gingerbread Man, while the Beanstalk Worm, creature that guards beanstalks for giants. Uh, most importantly, it also contains the Goose Mother, the most important creature, a Hydra-like creature. With goose heads. So. Honk, honk. Honk, honk. Uh, in recent years, they've crossed over with Magic the Gathering on several occasions. Strixhaven, Theros, Ravnica. This is the first digital-only release. So, yeah. Cool. That's fun. Probably not going to get it, but I love that you can... I love that we're now going to have access to the Goose Mother. Yeah. It's one of those things where it's like... The first, if I recall, the first like couple of, uh, of those... Um, Montrous Copendiums were free, weren't they? Yeah, the first one was. The first one was. I really one of them was Vecna. Vecna, def- that was that definitely... one was free, and then there was another one that was free. I wish they would keep it with the free because yeah, you get five creatures, but like they're already upping the price of everything else, you know. They're just nickel and diamond. They're like, nickel and diming. That's how they do. Uh, Fandelver. No, we talked about Fandelver. What am I talking about? What, what are you talking? About? We're we're talking? into the wrap up now. We'll wrap up the last couple of uh, things to shout out, and then we'll go into the question. Planescape previews. Planescape Adventures in the Multiverse is going to be the next D&D book. Um, they're, they're releasing small little tidbits of information to a whole collection of, out, of uh, media outlets. Most of it's kind of what you would expect, but there was one bit of information that I wanted to point out because I think it's the most interesting. Um, <laughs> Planescape Adventures in the Multiverse is going to be a box set style release, much akin to the Spelljammer box set, the much disliked yes. Spelljammer box set, which was released amid controversy, of course, from art uh, depicting uh, racist depictions of a, uh, uh, a character race option, uh, and then also had very low reviews for the quality of the books contained within. We bought 
uh, spell jammers for very very cheap on Amazon basically the week it came out yeah it was already not selling well because of the controversy and then when people got their hands on it it's like these books are like some of the thinnest D&D books ever the adventure book is like barely an adventure there's not really even ship combat rules in the spell jammer yeah setting um, so I was excited for I was somewhat excited for plane chase just because, like, plane hopping, planes hopping and planes walking is, like, just a fun concept to play around with in D&D. But the form of the release now has me concerned because of how bad the last time they, the one, the only other time they've really done a release like this that's going to be a pre-box set of three books that, the first one wasn't very good. No, they, they're really going to have to, tune it in and and make sure that they do this one right uh that or that or they uh can just plan on not doing that anymore um but it would be re- it would be a real sad thing to see if the because spell jammer is, is a is another um another piece about you know traveling the multiverse in a different way mm-hmm. uh so it'd be very sad to see if there if this iteration of of that same idea just kind of flopped as well um, so I guess we'll be watching it closely and, uh, not holding our breath. No, I'm not. I never hold my breath for them to do anything good. Uh, several days ago, we got a, a trailer and announcement for, or a, they already announced the D and D and Minecraft crossover, a DLC for Minecraft with a lot of D and D mechanics built in. And uh, a couple days ago, they announced the release date. It is today, as of recording. If you are Yay. listening to this podcast uh, later on podcast feeds, it's available right now that you can get from uh, you can get digitally in Minecraft. A um, lot of locations that are featured in the Forgotten Realms. You can go to you can go to uh, Candlekeep. <laughs> you can you're making rolls, insight, intimidation, persuasion. Your loot, like all the D and D shit that you would expect. It's very weird. I do love that they were like, here's the thing that we're doing. And then they said nothing. And then like five days before they're like, oh, it's coming out in five days. I'm a big fan of that release style for, for the video games. Yeah. We've gotten back into Minecraft recently. A little bit. Yeah. A little bit. You, you more so than me. Me much more so. But then than I got, I got pulled away almost immediately by Baldur's Gate. Yeah. Uh, I was actually texting, I was texting our friend Salem today because they were asking how I can, how they can help out with gathering materials. Cause I'm building a massive automated so- storing sy- storage system for our realms server in Minecraft. If you, if you know or care what that is. Um, it was the first time they had logged on in a while and apparently they were running around and they were like, Oh shit, you've done a lot of work. I'm like, yeah, I've, I've done a little bit of work. Done a little bit of work. Anyway, last last wrap up item. This one's just for me. I, I was just, gonna say I I we've I don't think we've ever uh, we've ever talked about a Kickstarter um, on. No, it, the Kickstarter is already closed. It it was um, this is from 1985 Games. They had a Kickstarter for a new whimsical campaign setting for Fifth Edition, uh, where you can create your own unforgettable tales on the island of Obojima. It had 23,416 backers pledging over $2.6 million to bring this 5e book to life. Uh, For those of you who don't know what what this is really all about, and you can't see it because this is an audio podcast, uh, this is a Studio Ghibli-inspired 5th edition campaign setting, which I'm a big fan of the Ghibli films, personally. Uh, it's going to come with all new mechanics for potion crafting, including 130 ingredients and over 180 potions that are available to craft. It has eight new subclasses, three races, 50 new spells, 60 new monsters, 50 new magic items, the hero's journey boon system, new feats and fighting styles, eight new familiars and familiar mechanics, 20 new weapons and weapon mechanics, and 10 chapters on the world and lore of Obojima. Uh... They basically hit all of their stretch goals as well. So you're going to be, if you manage to back it, you're going to be getting a lot of stuff. Uh, the Kickstarter is now closed, sadly. If you're a late pledge, you can pre order a hardcover version of the book for $50. I'm just bringing that up because it's cool and I like it. Can I, can I, I learned about it this week since the last podcast. So, can I buy a, buy a book for $50? I don't know. I don't can, know. I, can I ask for it for your birthday? Maybe. Actually, that is a good. That is a good birthday gift idea. Yeah. Can I, Jester, take that down. 
She's, she's Moon, she's, take that down. Moon. Oh, yes. Our assistant's the moon. <laughs> I don't even remember why the moon is our assistant anymore. That's so deep into the lore. <laughs> we That's haven't done bullshit. We haven't done bullshit lore. like that in a while. I would love one day for us to be in a position where we could hire a member of the community to... Like, just a, for a nominal fee, go through and create, like, a wiki, like a, like a, a fan, a wiki fandom wiki of that, just going over the lore of the Dungeon Bros podcast. Things we say in our fake, uh, in our fake ad reads, things we, the, the, the dumb shit, we, like the weird improv things we did right the, in the first couple episodes. The, the improv things, the, oh my God. Yeah. Just all of the lore, all of the lore that we've built around the podcast. Cause in 50 episodes, we've built a fair amount of lore. Yeah. I would say we should look back on some of the lore, but I didn't prep any of that, and I don't remember most of it. Hey, maybe that's something we can do for two-year celebration. That'd be fun. The Maybe for episode 100, but um, one of my favorite bits of lore was that sh- that string of episodes where we were getting interrupted in the middle of it. I was just going to mention that front one. Door. <laughs> there no one like, ever knocks on our front door. Never! And it, it wasn't two episodes in a row, but it was like episode where it happened, episode where it didn't, and then episode where it happened again. And it was like we were in the middle of we were in the middle of a discussion, and this is when we were still doing the podcast downstairs in the living room, so it was near the front door. Yeah, and the way we had the camera set up, you could see the front door behind us. <laughs> and we both we were talking, and then knock, 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 and we look back, and we're like, "Uh, okay, I'll go check the door." And then it's just some. Both times it was some random, or no, one time it was a random solicitor, and then another time it was someone being like, hey, one of the cars outside has a flat tire, is it yours? And we're like, oh, no, 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 it's not ours. Nope, what's well, nice? Yeah. I was, wor- I was worried that, like, I forgot to pay the water or something, and the water man came <laughs> to, like, beat us with a fucking crowbar and, and... Take our kneecaps. Yeah. Swallow them whole. This was pre-Pinkertons as well, so it wasn't a oh, Pinkertons right. reference. <laughs> <laughs> anyway it's weird that we've been doing this for two years and or almost two years now and so a lot of our a lot of the things we can say is like like not a lot of controversy happened in that first year that we were no. doing things it was this it was the second year when we when Ooh, like the big D yeah. controversies started happening really since this time last year like last fall yeah start it was like the rumblings about the ogl at the end of 2022 and then just all of 2023 has been a fucking mess oh yeah we also had the MTG 30th anniversary mm-hmm. bullshit last year. Oh, yeah, and the spell jam. Okay, so maybe it was just the last, like, year. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well. Fair. Samuel is going to look at the TikTok live chat. As as you may or may not know, we record this podcast live every other week on Tuesday, uh, usually around noon. Today we're recording it a little late because I worked overtime, picked up an extra shift at work, didn't really want to, but I got paid 12 hours for eight hours of work, and I'll take it. Uh but we record the podcast every other week live on TikTok where we will requisition questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and or ideas from our TikTok live viewers. And while Sam is looking at that, again, you can get the podcast every other week on Wednesdays on Apple, Google, Spotify, YouTube Music, as well as posted to our YouTube channel as a video. No, we do not show our faces on the video. We also have an Instagram, a TikTok, YouTube, Twitter, Discord, server, community, which doesn't really have a whole lot going on right now, but it's a Discord community make something happen we also have an amazon storefront which is a great way to support us we have a merch store the best way to support us arguably and then our monday night magic live streams where we play two-player commander most of the time sometimes we play jumpstart whenever there's like a new pre-release going on we get pre-release kits we open up kits we open up packs it's a whole thing it's a great time we also have a moxfield link up there for our deck lists samuel maybe we should as as a as a commentary from sam uh maybe we should split up those so we uh we're we're only people given a call to action one piece at a time People. I mean, we got a lot. We got a lot of actions to call out. Yeah, so we'll just call. I feel that maybe we, you know, we probably don't like. I don't need to call out the Discord or the Twitter, really. Yeah, I don't need to call All out right. the Amazon storefront, merch store, sure. Monday Night Live stream, sure. Deck lists, sure. YouTube, TikTok. And anyway, basically uh, most of them. Yeah, I want. I would like to. But anyway, Bree underscore M one asks, "What is the best resource to learn Dungeons and Dragons?" Uh, watching a uh, live play show. We're asking a, beard, a handsome bearded man to uh, instruct you in the ways. Um, like Matt Mercer. Is he currently bearded? Yeah, I think so. He, he flips between. Yeah, uh, he, same with Brandon Lee Mulligan. Yeah, they're, they're not unbearded for long. Uh, but yeah, a lot of YouTube, a lot of good YouTube content out there. Ooh, yeah, I, 
I learned the mechanic. I've talked about this on the podcast many a times. I learned to play D and D from a, a YouTube channel called Don't Stop Thinking, where they had a wonderful learn to play D and D series with like animations and stuff that really helped me learn a lot of the mechanics and how to like create a character and mm. stuff, which was really helpful. Uh, you learned from Matt Colville, yeah, the illustrious. Indeed, we have a lot of his con- a lot of his content around our house now. Oh yeah, and we'll yeah. be getting so- more here soon. Oh yeah, um, man, I would, it'd be fu- it'd be fun if we could convince him to like come on a podcast one time. That'd be he's, cool. He's a really big name, and we are not. Here's the thing: I, I, we we could totally shoot our shot, though. We could shoot our shot. I mean, we got shots worth shooting. We I haven't. Should, we've haven't really shot that many shots up to this shot. That's true. That is true. I've Matt shot, Colville, if you're listening, we love you on the podcast. I have shot two shots. One of them, one of them to a guy from Corridor Digital because they used to do D and D Let's Plays a lot on their Node YouTube channel. Mm. Or they did like they did like mini campaigns. They made it like they made it like six episodes, and they'd be like forty five minute episodes, and then they'd make the movie, which was like four hours of their session. Gotcha. Pretty much. Um, but it was like highly edited and stuff, and it was like presented more as like a proper YouTube video as opposed to just like a let's play. And then I uh, shot the shot uh, for Last Time Media, Colin Moriarty, when they were talking about the um, when th- when they announced the virtual tabletop, and I was like, it'd be really cool if they put it on like PlayStation VR. He actually he actually messaged me back, and he was like, yeah, if if they announce it for PlayStation VR, then we could totally talk about because they have a very mm-hmm. big PlayStation podcast. And I was like, sweet. And then they don't have VR support. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> well, I was. It was really cool of him to get back to me, though. That was. I thought that was really, really cool. Much respect to them. Um. Let's see. Totally Ooh. just hijacked that question to talk about uh, getting podcast guests. <laughs> Uh, Golden Host blog. I'm starting a campaign based on history, eating, and en- enemies. Any thoughts on or any tips or thoughts for creating time wraith or time liches? Oh, that's Ooh. that's weird. I think it would be they'd be. I think that there'd be honestly very little setup when it comes to that. Like you could just, you know, it's really going to come down to when your players start doing things like. I would probably make this an act two or three of a campaign where it's like, okay, we've done some stuff and now we're a little bit famous, but oh no, suddenly like people don't remember who we are or like these big events in history that we are referencing all the time and that are very important. Like they're suddenly not there or, or like a major thing that we thought is that we, that we knew like a major detail is different. Yeah. That kind of stuff. I think that'd be fun as a, as, as for like battle mechanics, uh, it requires a lot of work on the DM's part, but I love the the idea of like when if you have a if you have a, a printed out stat block and you're like using it to track spell slots and damage mm-hmm. and stuff, you could take a picture of it and then mentally make a note or write down its position on the battle map, and then on a future turn when it's like about to go down, have it do something where it like pulls itself back several turns and it's reverted to its state at that point, and Ooh. then it tries something different. Probably also be able to give it a lot of evasion mechanics for like melee com- or things like that, um, mm-hmm. to where it's like, you know, if it gets hit, it can use a reaction to cause that to miss and you know move move somewhere else based on where it's been recently. Yeah, and um, you could even you could even use like evasion the oh yeah the, the, ability, yeah, the ability and just flavor it differently. I love I love taking abilities like that and flavoring them fun. All right, Anthony uh, Cormier. What's your what? Who's your least favorite commander to see across the table? Ugh. Last night it was Elrond. <laughs> <laughs> you were fucking whooping me. Oh, my least favorite. We don't. It's basically limited to the the decks that we play and then our friends play. Yeah, which um, is the problem. I think honestly, so let's just go with the ones we play on Monday Night Magic the most. I would say right now it's either Feather or Narset. Your yeah, your spell slinger decks. Yeah, those are dangerous. Those those can go. You know, once you got your setup, you're you're going and it's over pretty mm-hmm. much. I'm always terrified of Brutaclad, but I feel like Brutaclad doesn't get to pop off nearly as much. He doesn't. I've re- re- recently revamped him, so hopefully he gets to do a little more, a little more, more often yeah. now. But one that I was originally terrified of when you said you were making it, but I am now like really not scared of at all was Shelob. 
Yeah, Shelob, I think, was really cool in concept, and I, it's just not enough. It's it's too high cost of a commander for a a or for spiders, which there's not a lot of spider support. Mm-hmm. There have been mostly spiders that are like little attack, big butt, maybe have reach, maybe have death touch. But there's not like there's no mana dork spiders and there's no card draw spiders and there's no you know is there is there not even like changelings that you could like f- figure out a way to make that work? Not really. I mean, like I you actually, could also just run non spiders. Could I did grab? I wanted. I'm I'm hoping to revamp that at some point. I just haven't had the influ the the uh, drive drive. Yeah. Um, but I, I did grab mask mask wood nexus from you for mm-hmm. when you were doing your trade binder. Um, to hopefully maybe convert into one of those lesser, yeah, like uh, this this type doesn't have a lot of support like spiders. Maybe like so get a bunch of those into a deck and then oh now suddenly everything you know finally find maps when next is now everything's a spider and everything's a griffin and everything's a I think that's Kithkin. that's a great like game ender but like if you run enough spiders that you can execute on the strategy and then have the non spiders that have abilities and stuff that support the strategy really well and then Maxwell Nexus is just like oh they're all now spiders too and now it's a problem you know I think that's a great way to so I wouldn't necessarily want to build around having to search up Na- Mask with Nexus. I mean, if you have a commander that specifically like goes and fetches something, yeah, but she, she, multiple command, but she love no, oh, true, gosh. true. But anyway, um, let's see who's next. Um, Knocked what seven one seven one asks, should I buy D and D books now or next year? Ooh, that's tough. That's really tough. Um. I would not buy 5th edition core rule books right now. I think that's a little silly. You really should wait until the next spring. Um, If you really want to play 5th edition D&D right now, just look up the rules online, and then you can get the the revised 5th edition, the one Mm D&D core rule books when they come out in March next year. Um, There's plenty of resources online, either for free to get the basic rules, or there's definitely some sites out there that uh, kind of skirt the... Like, like the eyes of the watchful Watsi. Some tools for 5e, like a 5e tools, like a 5e dot tools <laughs> kind of thing. All right. Squirrel, squirrel, uh, sorry, squirt box warrior. Jesus, what kind of water people you got out there when I said they broke, when we said they broke our kneecaps and swallowed <laughs> them whole. Um, I knew I'd seen your faces. Stumbled across your Magic the Gathering stream last night. You guys are from Kentucky. Nice. Yeah, we yes. are. Yes, we are. Thanks for popping in again. Yeah. Every Monday night we play Magic the Gathering. It's a good time. Highly recommend. Actively Throwing says, hello, what is your suggestions on fully home-built commander decks? Uh, tried to see... Uh, tr- tired of seeing all e- CEDH deck lists. So, we did one live stream where I came to you and I was like, Sam... Don't tell me what your deck is. Mm-hmm. Pick a legendary creature that you have. Build it with only cards that you have on hand. And I came back with an Aster Bearer of Blades equipment deck. Mm-hmm. And I don't remember what deck you made. Tigum Ojatai Master. Yes, yes. That was a fun. That was a fun little building challenge, of like seeing what you have and mm-hmm. then trying to build something around that. Yeah, that's. I mean, we got our start in pre cons mm-hmm. at at Gen Con last year. Um, and then from there, you know, obviously you can always just open packs. Our, our buddy Darren, that's what he does mostly is open packs. He's opened a lot of packs, yeah. a ridiculous amount of packs. Did he even turn any, like he, did he trade anything in a Gen Con or did he keep uh, like everything? He, he meant for us to trade in these. Yeah. Th- for those of you, th- this is a, this is a pack. This is a little resealable pack of like 20, 30 cards. And then I think if he that. And then you think he just sold a bunch to a game store. Okay, um, fair enough. Fair enough. But uh, yeah, so that that's always going to be hard um, unless you again open a lot and a lot and a lot of packs. But you know, just getting a lot of those staples in there that are ten cents, fifteen cents, mm-hmm. a, a dollar or two. Um, just get five command towers. Get five soul rings. Arcane signal. Uh, yeah. So yeah, start start with uh, start with your your staples that you need for your mana and your card draw and all that, and then from there be like all right what cool thing works with my deck i also hate building like you know choosing cards i don't, I don't want to spend uh you know 30 dollars for a deflecting swap for every red deck i have yeah 
So it's like, okay, what other cards can I use to like, you know, if I need to reroute dam or you know, reroute a spell or something? There's a lot. There's a lot of cards like that that have cards that do effectively the same thing with like a slight limitation or a slight deviation in mana cost or something like that. Uh, that instead of costing forty dollars, cost like twenty cents. <laughs> so good trade offs. And have a, and uh, make sure you have enough removal. Always run more removal. Uh, don't cut lands. And from there, choose interesting uh, again. Choose interesting commanders that maybe aren't uh, aren't in the meta. That's true. We've seen a, you, you know you can go online and watch a bunch of people play Kalia the Vast. You can't go online and watch a lot of people play. Uh, oh, for example, Cadric Soul Kindler. Mm-hmm. Not really anybody is playing Edgar the Charmed Groom and Olivia the Crimson Bride. Because technically, that's not <laughs> that's it's also uh, not legal. Also, nobody was playing Edgar the Charmed Groom when it was just Edgar. <laughs> true. All my all my other and some people play Topolar. He's not very powerful. Let's see. What do you think about flying races being broken in, fi- in I assume, d and I think it's only broken as you allow it. Yeah. I mean, flying is powerful, but at the same time, like, fly is a level three spell, right? Yes. So level five characters that are spellcasters would be able to fly. Yeah. So, uh, Ara, you know, your Aarakocra, level one, great. That's fine. That's like their main thing. They don't get much else. And if, as, if, if you are a DM and you have one of these characters who is uh, a flyer, they're still vulnerable to range attacks. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And enemy spellcasters. Yeah. And, and area of effects. And ceilings. Other flying. <laughs> Ceiling. <laughs> Ooh, reverse gravity. Just start all of your encounters reverse gravity. <laughs> All of your encounters are done in uh, crawl spaces. Yeah, yeah. Ooh, magnify gravity. Okay, the level one spell from Explorer's Guide to Wild Mount, magnify gravity. Mm-hmm. Bring that sucker right back to the fucking ground. Just saying. Uh, that was from Sleepy S- Sleep Star of Nerd, and they also just got the number one gifter badge. Thank oh, you, Sleep Star Nerd. Thank you. Uh, and that is the end of our list. End of the inquiries for now. A, a normal, a normal length episode of the Dungeon Bros podcast. I think. The, the optimal way to celebrate the 50th episode of the Dungeon Bros podcast is being absolutely average is being decidedly fine as extremely mid I wouldn't I wouldn't say we're mid middle of the road medium medium rare Ooh. medium rare road medium uncommon medium uncommon <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't say we're common we're medium I uncommon know if we, I don't know if I'd say we're rare either that's fair and uncommon. Yeah. So, uh. You get a couple of us in a pack. Yeah. It, it, I mean, you know, maybe hopefully in a couple sets down the road will be worth, uh, will be people will be like, wow, this is a great card and they'll be worth like five bucks a piece. Yep. Hey, why am I? Hey, why am I? Love that. Anyway. Thank you guys for hanging out today. And in the meantime, peace out. <laughs>